This is Eugene Hardaway Bridges, and you're listening to Retrospective, right here with John Broughton on 3SER, KC Radio. Okay. Just to start, I believe you spent Christmas in Singapore, is that right? Yeah, I uh, I flew out to my club. I have a club uh, where I'm the resident blues man, and uh, where I teach, and uh, I had a chance to spend Christmas Day and, and Christmas Eve there uh, with the gang that I, I teach. I had a chance to uh, get some of the guys up, some of my students, and uh, help play some blues and enjoy our our time together. It's one of the homes away from home. <laughs> you do spend an enormous amount of time on the road, and one of your albums was named Man Without a Home. Do you feel like that sometimes? Well, I always feel that way. Uh, there's three reasons why I had I named that album Man Without a Home, but only two I could talk about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one where I, you know, all my life I'm, I'm, I'm been uh, a musician. I just celebrated 44 years on the 2nd of January of playing guitar. And all my life I've been from uh, one place to the other bringing music to the world. And uh, not only just in my neighborhood, but to the world. Uh, the second reason is I... As a child growing up, I went to like nine different schools, so I never felt at home just in that one town, you know, like a lot of people, what most people have, you know, grown up in one town. Some military personnel, their families can understand what I'm talking about, um, but, you know, as a, as a uh, starting out, I lived in so many towns and met so many people, and, and it just felt that I was not in that one city long enough to to make it just that one you know that one place that I can call home now one question I often ask guitar players is if they can remember their first guitar and I believe yours wasn't a guitar as such but a, a plastic shovel can you tell us about that my my first my first guitar were at three years old my dad sold me with this plastic shovel playing uh and I had some rubber bands on it because people were here you know, when you hear a triangle by or whatever, you know, they, you know, bop, wow, 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 you know, I would hear melodies like, wa da la da da la da la, stuff like that. And um, there was a sound in my head that needed to come out. And I remember the first time my dad saw that and he gave me, he, he, he set me where I wouldn't fall over the place on the edge of the bed. And he put his guitar that he had gotten for Christmas. In 1964, um, it was a Harmony Rocket uh, HH59 uh, model, and I'll never forget it stretching my hand all the way down the edge of that neck to try to make those cards and everything. Yeah, I'll never forget it. It's like yesterday. <laughs> there is a great musical pedigree in your family. Tell us about your dad and, and his influence on you in taking up a life in music. Well, my dad was known as High. Hideaway Slim, and um, since a kid, he, he grew up dragging a guitar around, just like myself, you know, as a baby, and he was influenced by people like B.B. King, T-Bone Walker, uh, Lightning Hopkins, Jimmy Reed, and to me, I didn't know anything about these guys, they were just names to me, even until I was 16, 17 years old, they were just names to me, but, I, but he was... He would play the blues, and when when my mom left, he left her. He he left my dad with five children to raise by himself, and that's how he fed us by playing the blues and took care of the house and paid the bills, playing the blues. But he never, uh, he gave it up. He gave up the blues when I when I was uh, uh, seven years old. He's preaching now. Mm. I believe there's also a well-known musical connection on your mother's side of the family as well. Yeah, Anime Bullock. That's my mama's second cousin. Oh, that's my mama's cousin. That's my second cousin, uh, Tina Turner. You know, as Tina Turner, she was uh, highly into the into the music scene around that area. And and um, my mom, she sang a little. I mean, she wasn't a professional singer, but you know, she she held a tune or whatever. But uh, Anime Bullock, yeah, that's my that's my second cousin. Now, with that singing connection in your family, I believe that you weren't all that keen to uh, pursue singing? It was more the, 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 the playing that you were interested in? Well, 
I think you were, because again, that was, um, if it wasn't for my dad walking in, catching me choking my brother, <laughs> you know, because he, he was the lead singer. I did sing some back backing vocals. I I I started out as a, a baritone singer. Then I went to fifth tenor singer. Then I went to tenor singer, uh, singing backup. And again, as I sing these melodies, I used to, I used to sing myself to sleep, singing these melodies at at three years old and four. And so the I think the singing was destined to come out. And one day my dad saw me choking my brother. He's older than me. And he kept messing up the song, you know. So I would grab him by the neck and I would choke him. And my dad said, if you want it done right, you do it yourself. I said, okay, boom. And from that point on, I started singing. And I, I didn't know anything about it. I was supposed to be shy or I'm supposed to be nervous. I'd never been nervous. So I just went on and did the job that needed to be done. I could hear the sound. I know the sound needed to be, you know, laid out and perfect and and. So yeah, I, I think I was destined to be a singer. I just didn't know I was going to be a singer. Yeah. <laughs> so aside from from your dad, who were some of the other guitar players that really caught your attention as a young boy? That was it. I mean, I didn't know anybody. That that was it. Uh, you, I was I I, was, I grew up in a small, uh, in a, just a small country side of the town and everything, and I was more of a leader than than a than a follower because. At seven, I was always teaching, so I I never knew anyone to take guitar lessons from or be influenced by anyone. Um, the the name BB King, Jimmy Reed, T Bone Walker, I didn't know anything about that. You know, I didn't know what they sound like or what they played like because in our household, my grandmother never allowed anything. If it wasn't blue, if if it wasn't gospel, it was not allowed in the house. You know, so I I never knew who anybody were until like years later, you know, when I had a chance to hear BB King, when I had a chance to tour with the Mighty Clouds of Joy later on in life, I met Spanky, who was the guitar player, uh, the guitar player from the the uh, 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 the Brooklyn All Stars, a lot of the gospel greats from back in the day, you know, I would learn things from them. And uh, from Ira Tucker, his guitar player, uh, you know, and later on, B.B. King's backup guitar player, Leon Warren. These are guys I met, like, once I became a grown man who was, who was inspiring me. But there was never anyone out there other than B.B. King that, that I, I found and I saw in my dad, you know, because my dad was inspired by B.B. King. But that was that was it. I never I never even listened to any records or, or anything like a lot of cats who learning to play music, who who take guitar lessons or who learning to play. They would take a, their, their favorite uh, artist and listen to it and or find someone who inspired them. But it was actually life that inspired me. This just everyday life. I never had a chance to learn from anyone. Now you spent some time in the Air Force, playing in the Air Force band, I believe. What what did that experience do for you in, in terms of your grounding as a, as a musician? Uh, I think the main thing were in in the Air Force were trying to get musicians there to join into what I can do because um, I started out I, when I when I when I joined the Air Force. Uh, Few people knew that I played guitar, so I wanted to put together a band. I had auditions for m many people that showed up who was not musician whatsoever or had anything to do with music whatsoever, but they claimed it. So it was more like me bringing out my style to them instead of following the Air Force groove or tell them telling me what to play or following their uh, beat or following their thing. I they that was my opportunity to express myself, you know, in, in every Sunday and every Saturday, I had an opportunity to play. Even on Fridays, I had an opportunity to play and travel around the uh, Texas area where I was stationed and, uh, and play in different concerts with, with the band that I put together myself. But basically, it just gave me an opportunity to you know, reach a, a, a little bit more people that I was able to reach on my own. 
Now you mentioned you had some time with the mighty clouds of joy, and that that gospel element in your music has has always been there. It, Bob Dylan once said he uh, would have trouble believing or trusting an artist that didn't have some element of gospel in their music. Do you feel that way too sometimes? Well, I'm gonna tell you, I know what Bob Dylan was talking about because he seen it. He saw it from the outside. With the the what he's trying, what he's saying is, it's the spirit of what you're saying that comes through in a song that people can feel, other than just 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 saying a bunch of things. You you if you if you really look at a lot of pop music right now, it has no spirit, it has no root, it has no no grounding. You know, it's just it's, it's just glued together. You know, it's, it's something fast, quick. Uh, you know, quick fix. You know, here for, here today, gone today. But the the spiritual side of the music, be it gospel, be it black gospel, uh, 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 uh oriental gospel, uh, spiritual music, be it um, European spiritual music. No matter what it is, the spiritual side of that comes through in some music where you can feel it, not just hear it. And then there's other music, you go through the motion without emotion. And that's what Bob Dylan was talking about, you know. Anything without emotion, it's, you're just going through the motion. So how much of the power and the quality of your voice today do you, would you attribute to, to your gospel background? Everything. Yeah. Because without, without that, uh, that sound comes from the church. No matter, you know, people say black gospel. I can listen to any black artist sing black american artists take me sorry i mean <laughs> uh make that straight there you know with with black american artists i can listen to their voice and i can tell what religion they're from whether it's baptist methodist pentecostal church of god in christ uh church of living god non-denomination or if, if there was no religion whatsoever because the spirit of what they what they're what they're saying comes through you know, and the way they have church, the way they have church service. Same thing with Church of England. Same thing with with Catholic Church. That sound comes through. If you hear Robbie Williams sing, and you listen to some of the some of the uh, uh, progressive, you know, gospel from you know the spiritual songs from Church of England and and Protestant and stuff, you hear you you hear that type of groove. The same thing from that type from that groove. You wouldn't hear, you know, stomp down, down country Baptist church or Church of God in Christ church, preacher church, you know, kind of sing it in his voice. You have it, it represent where you come from. So, yeah, my sound comes from a lot of the lot of the preaching that I, you know, I grew up, you know, listening to as as a child at seven years old. I was my dad's backup uh, guitar player. Uh, I played for my pastor. You know, I, uh, I travel with him. I, I, my dad started a gospel group with my brothers called the Bridges Brothers. I was teaching other kids at seven years old how to play. Uh, so the church played a big part in in our life, especially if you're black American. You went to church or else. And that was the grounding of everything that you did. You know, even even the blues. I mean, that's where the blues come from. The blues was born out of the gospel mm. and i try to i try to put those that that groove and that melody and that, that kind of style into my music with the stories of real life so was there a defining moment when you knew that the time was right for you to to step out front and, and be your own band leader uh yeah at, at four years old <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah three months uh, uh two months later after i picked up the guitar I knew what I wanted to do right then and there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I've been working for I've been working towards that all my life, you know. And there's times when you uh, when you're being ignored, you by everyone else, and who have the power to to put you into the right light and everything. You you've been ignored and overlooked. You can't overlook yourself. You can't ignore yourself. So yeah, I've been knowing that since I was a kid. You know, everything else from that point on, I knew exactly what I wanted to do at four years old, and uh, everything else was considered uh, secondary, part time. You know, once I finished school, I just wanted to get that over with, so I could go on and make my music. 
Uh, I didn't care about nine to five. I didn't care about, you know, you know, raising a family and settling down in one house and living in one place. And my job is to bring the music around the world and continue to bring it. And and with this being my, you know, what, 20, 24th trip to Australia now wow. um, and, 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 and around the world for 40 you know, out of 44 years, I've been around the world for like the past 22 years, you know, and I'm nowhere near slowing down. And this is what I was born to do. And I, I knew this from four years old. You went to Armadillo Records after your first uh, album. How did that uh, deal come about? Well, Armadillo was behind me even when I was back with uh, Born to be Blue with uh, Blue Side Records. They've been supportive of me and looking after me. Uh, once I played a concert for for uh, for the owner, he was a dairy farm, and I used to go down to his place to uh, kind of work off some of that love I've been receiving from all over the world in in the way of good weight, you know, li- gaining weight and everything. I used to go down there uh, to the to his farm and kind of work supposed to be working it off but they wouldn't let me mess up my hands because you know you you're a guitar player you don't want to mess up your hand but he saw the potential of what what i was about and needed to get my name out among you know more as to many people as possible even when my own label i was with was refusing to do so uh or holding back and it was a dream come true. It was it was uh, a light that 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 come to you know that 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 come to to my darkest hour, and uh, yeah, and so they they signed me. I didn't I didn't need the song and dance. Matter of fact, I haven't even read my con- my contract. I just signed the bottle. Say where you want me to sign. Boom, <laughs> and it's been a it's, it's been a love affair since for the past ten years now, and. Uh, and we're 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 like family, and uh, they really look after me and and help me to be the best Eugene Hideaway Bridges that I can be, and uh, that's that's all I ever asked for for these you know all these many years of 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 being in America and being anywhere else you know this is what I always ask for and they just doing the best they can to try to make that so. There'd be a lot of artists to be very jealous of you having that kind of relationship with your label. It's pretty rare. A lot of a lot of a lot of artists are they 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 look at me as wow Eugene already made it so move out of the way hook me up with your record company and let me let me it's my turn now <laughs> you know I'm still I'm still I'm still trying to make it you know it's it's places like Australia that have been been there with me and for me and places like. England, who had been there for me, and 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 all over Europe and all over the Orient, you know, when when my own home refuses to, you know, let me do what I was born to do, you know, sometimes you got to run away from home to be able to come home, but I just need to be able to do what I was born to do. You've picked up a, a great network of musicians around the world to, who have played with you and recorded with you at various times. You've recorded down here with some of our musicians. It must be a great feeling to to, to come to a place so far from home and have musicians that will just comfortably slide into your to, into the feel of your music. I tell you what, man, this is Australia musicians that I've worked with. There, you know, you got your A team, you got your B team, then you got your OK team. Well, Australia have always been my A team from day one i mean those guys uh i have a hammond player there mr clayton dolly from from sydney Mm -hmm. and he's most he's the finest musician i ever met in my life writing singing playing listening you know laying down the groove i mean out all out when i come to australia i just want to take all those guys and just put them in a in a sack and 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 just take them with me everywhere around the world, you know. <laughs> and uh, there's there's a, there and uh, they are they're just some fantastic musicians. 
uh, and friends also, Ian Moss, the greatest vocalist that ever come out of Australia. I still, I still say that, and I mean it. He is the. I, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of fantastic singers like Diesel, uh, Jimmy Bond. You know, you got a lot of great singers, male and female, there in Australia. But Ian Moss was one of the greatest vocalists I've ever heard come out of Australia. Yeah, and I had him on guitar on one of the, uh, on on, on the. Eugene Hathaway Bridges uh, solo album, uh, self-titled album, and he played he played guitar on on there with me, and to even just work with him and and hang out with him at, on backstage and do some shows together on stage, it just it just it just clicks and it's just gels. It just feels right at home. My bass player uh, Rowan Lane, you know, he's he do everything he possibly can to to make this journey comfortable you know, and uh, helpful in, in any way they possibly can. You know, Declan Kelly, when he's on the drums, he just lays down a groove. He's another Al Jackson. And I love those guys, every last one of them, and to be able to work with them. Even a lot of the musicians, you know, Jenny Marie Lang that I've worked with, and she's she done some support for us, and she's she was on the stage with us. Uh, Kyra Granger, fantastic. Scene. It, I can just go on and on. There's so many. There's so many fantastic musicians there in Australia. It's one of the highlights of coming there. So I can be entertained as well as to entertain there. I could be into entertained with some quality sounds and quality music. Now, you recently put out a live album, which many of your, your long-time fans would be delighted about. But do you approach a show any differently I, knowing it's going to be recorded for a live album? Not really. I mean, I don't see. I just, what I do, it just happens. You know, uh, whether it's three people or 3,000 people, or, you know. I was in Sydney, and we had the opportunity to fly over to Texas back in March to uh, do a charity uh, celebrity roast for a, a great basketball player, American basketball player, used to play for the uh, Spurs. Um, and while I was there, I figured I'd gather up all the boys and we record a live album. People have been asking for a live album, so I decided to reach back from from uh, from so many years song that I recorded way back in the day up until t you know the latest the latest album and just do it live and just have a good time. I want people to feel that energy from the live concerts other than just from the studio uh, uh, album. I love doing the studio album. Don't get me wrong. I, I love that. And But when we do a live show, it's, it's, it's just letting, letting loose what we've been doing all the time where people can feel that energy because you know, they. You know, I've had a lot of complaints that, oh well, out studio albums they could, they could engineer it to make you sound all right. But what do you sound live? How <laughs> how you gonna how you gonna do it live and everything? You know, are you gonna live up to the to the same quality live? <laughs> <laughs> and I love I love proving myself. I love showing the world, you know, that I'm not scared of anything when it comes down to singing and playing and performing. So I had the opportunity to record it, and I was looking forward to it. And the guys did a fantastic job, and Mr. Pat Manske did a great job engineering it and mixing it and everything. And, um, yeah, it, it come out, and right now it is sitting at number two in the Living Blues charts there in America, and we're pretty happy about that and everything. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, we're looking forward to come down and... And share that with Australia, and share it with. Uh, we we started out in America there, and we're gonna share it with uh, Australia and over here in Europe. Right now I'm in in UK. I got a show coming up tomorrow night, and over the weekend, you know, down all, up on the north side of England, if we can make it through the snow. <laughs> but uh, we, we're looking forward to sharing it with with the UK and and the rest of the world. Yes, yeah, real good, good, great album. What about it though? In in a studio situation, is it hard to recapture that live feel and live energy? Are there any any special things you do to try and maintain that feel? Well, the thing I I try to um, when I'm in the studio, sometimes the musician cannot feel 
that bass line or that rhythm line or that piano line or a horn line that I really want. So I'm concentrating on one thing at a time, one portion of it at a time, because I know exactly how I want this laid in stone, you know, because there's no going back. Once it's, once it's in stone, that's exactly how I want it played out and laid out. Uh, I also expect that same thing when I'm on stage, but alive. A lot of times, uh, musicians forget about that, except for those cats that I'm working in, uh, with in Australia. They they lay it out just like I play it out. I mean, they 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 can hear they can hear what I'm doing and and really lay it out and everything. So the studio albums, it's it's kind of like making sure. That everything is laid in stone the way it is. I can hear it in my head, you know. I'm I'm a stickler to details. It's got to be exactly where, the way I feel it, because I, I I play by emotion. I listen to emotion. I I travel with the emotion, and and uh and I want to capture that. And it's gonna be it's gonna be captured in stone. So, but but the performance, the singing is still the same. I mean, uh. It's just that's just how I'm feeling at the time. I mean, there's not a live audience there, and and we're not trying to r rush everything into a three minute or ten minute, you know, sex uh, segment for radio play or whatever. You know, you just do it, you know, and and you're talking to the people and everything about a song that's already been recorded, and you just want to deliver that sound that that you already recorded. With a new album, when you're in the studio, you you you're trying you you're trying to capture exact emotion you was feeling when you're sitting on a plane, thinking about that song, and that song is playing in your head, and you you writing it down on the back of that that throw up bag that they put in the back <laughs> of the back seat of the of the of the of the plane seat there, or when you're driving around in the van. And all of a sudden, a song hits you, and you grab something, and you grab your telephone, and you sing it into the, into the dictaphone of your telephone. You want to capture that emotion, you know, that same emotion that you you feeling when you when you hear a phrase and say, "Wow, I know what that I know what that person is talking about." I'm gonna capture that into that song and the bass line. I'm gonna capture that into the into the groove line and everything. So you want to try to deliver that type of thing exactly the way you feel it, you know, not holding back or not short shortcutting it and everything. And just before I let you go, Eugene, after Australia, what, what's uh, in your books for the rest of the year? Have you got uh, 2010 pretty well mapped out? <laughs> well, I got, as far as I know, I'm going to be in Australia from uh, uh, January until May and then return back to Australia. Uh, from uh, October and November for some dates. Now, as far as the rest of the world, I plan to be uh, coming back to the UK and do some shows in Europe as well as uh, uh, America before returning to Australia in October and November. Now, each time my record company or other agents have worked for us are uh, bringing in dates. What I try to do is, what they put it all together and they let me know like six months ahead, three months ahead or something like that. Way enough ahead in advance where, you know, I can kind of know what I'm doing ahead of time and everything. But right now, as far as I know, I'm booked until October uh, 2010. Uh, sorry, November 2010. Fantastic. So we can look forward to seeing you down here twice during the year, which is great. Uh, Eugene, thanks for your time. I know you've had a pretty late night last night, so you're probably keen to go and get some rest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, it was a, I'm, I'm not used to dealing with a lot of the snow. Well, I, you know, you, you pass through it, you you drive through it, you know, but you're only dealing with it on a 24-hour basis or something like that. This is the first time having to, uh, <laughs> to kind of live through it, you know, for a few days. But... Uh, we're looking forward to getting down there and say howdy to everybody, and and down in Melbourne and across uh, New South Wales and and up in the Northern Territory and Queensland. We're looking forward to all of that. Fantastic, and we're looking forward to seeing you. It's like a homecoming every time you come here. You're virtually a, an honorary Australian, as far as we're concerned, and we're uh, looking forward to catching you once again. Well, there's a song that I'm, I'm uh, I wrote. And uh, I'm I I can't I can't let the cat out the bag yet, but it's called uh, I, uh, my southern home, and it's about Australia. 
<laughs> Terrific. And we'll turn on some warm weather for you so you can thaw out. Oh, yeah, I'll be ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> All the best to you, Jane. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm,